This is Jocko Podcast number 131. With Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. It is time for some Q&A. Yes. Should we banter around for a while or should we just get started? Question number one. I have been somewhat of a pushover for the majority of my life. Since listening to the podcast, I've been trying to assert myself more. One thing I can't seem to shake is constantly being interrupted. How can I rise above and overcome this obstacle? Should I read, read the hashtag? The there? hashtag fellow hardcore kids. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you go. Hey, we'll read, hardcore kids. Yeah, yeah. And there's a little layer in there because you put rise above in there. So, <laughs> sure. you know, I, I, so I thought about this because I would say I don't get interrupted a lot. Yeah. But I don't, I think that's kind of the current state yeah. of me. Sure. And I think there's a reason why I don't get interrupted a lot. And it's not because, you know, people are going to think, oh, well, that's because you're going to bash people in the head with a club. Mm-hmm. That's not the actual answer <laughs> of why I don't get interrupted. Yeah, don't so w- one thing I think is important is, you've heard me say this before, the less people talk, the more people listen. So when I'm in a group of people that all want to talk and they all want to talk over each other and they want to cut each other off, you get in that group right there, I, I don't talk. Yeah. <laughs> I don't talk. I let their. I, I sit there. I listen to them, and I plot, and I think, and I put together my thoughts correctly, so that when I do decide to say something, it's going to have impact. Hmm. And then I wait for the right moment, right? Because if there's people that are bickering back and forth, I wait for a lull in the fire, and when that lull comes then I make my point in a very direct manner. I might even I might even have to wait until the conversation is like all but over. Mm. Wait till they're done with their little firefight. Yep, 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 yep. And then I'm gonna talk. Like they're done. And and what I when I talk, you know, I'm gonna do it since I've been thinking about it, it's gonna be articulated in a way that I can present my full point and I so I think that's an effective way to do things I think I think if you let people speak a bunch you let them get it out of their system and then when you decide to talk they don't have anything left to say so that's a way to stop getting cut off so this is almost like flanking right this Mm -hmm. is flanking the fact that when people have a bunch to say and they got all these thoughts in their head and they want to get them all out let them get them out don't try and fight that battle they've got a bunch of things they want to say let them say it also as we know when you listen to someone else talk it you you now know what their ideas are yeah. <laughs> you, you know what they're thinking there's a power in not saying anything because it allows you to think and it allows you to hear what other people think and it allows you to hear other people so in a conversation you get to hear other people's counters to what people are saying and you're not you're not having to expend any ammunition yourself someone else is doing it you know mm-hmm. the, the third or fourth or fifth piece person in the conversation that's expending ammunition and running their mouth to try and so- counter some point that someone's made let them do that because mm-hmm. by the way then you get to see what the other counter is mm. so I think being assertive doesn't mean talking more I think being assertive means talking less talking at the appropriate times monitoring and understanding the firefight that's happening so that when other people have expended their ammunition you can step in and you can take your shots yeah. in a simple clear concise manner yeah. that's what I think yeah I think you're right I think you built up this reputation though that's a little added element to your specific situation which is where what? when you talk it like you're not saying fluff you know you're you know when you talk it's like something well that's a good point so if you don't want to get cut off and 70 percent of the things that you say aren't really that impactful and don't add a lot to the conversation well then there's a good chance that when you open your mouth to start talking someone else doesn't think it's gonna be important so they just jump right on top of you yeah but if you say less and to your point if the things that you say generally are well thought out and clear and are gonna have impact well then we have a good chance that you're not going to be cut off because yeah. people actually want to hear what you're gonna say yeah don't talk just to talk ever yeah see and that's a hard well, I shouldn't say ever but hardly ever yeah yeah that's a hard one the, 
because it, and it's not like people are interrupting you on purpose because you don't have nothing to say. You know, like you're just talking fluff. That's not, it's not a conscious on purpose thing. A lot of the time, I think anyway, it doesn't feel like it is. Um, it feels like it's like subconscious, you know, like how can someone see fit to actually follow through with interrupting somebody if they don't think like, OK, this isn't quite that important. At the very least, at the very least, what I'm about to interrupt with is more important. So, so you're least, saying some think people that. think that what they're about to say is really important. Yeah. Here's another thing. It's like the little boy that cried wolf, right? If I yeah. if I talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, I'm taking away the value of each one of those statements that I make yeah, yeah. because I'm making so many statements that not all of them can have a high level of value. Yeah. So if well, who do you who do you pay more attention to? The person that makes 100 statements? Yeah. And what are those Okay, let's say you want to pay attention to the person that makes 100 statements. How much can you pay attention to those 100 statements? How much do you how much do you gather from those 100 statements? Yeah. It's it's a limited amount. Yeah. It's one percent per statement, right? Well, it's one percent. You have to. F- yeah, yeah. You, well, you, the guy makes a hundred yeah, statements. Yeah, that's one yeah. percent per statement. Yeah. If the person says one thing, how much percent do you pay attention to that? 100%. That's right. You said it. hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, it makes sense, dude. Check. Good luck with that, fellow hardcore kid. So I guess he'd kind of have. I mean, assuming that oh, you know we understand his situation, it's hard um, overall. It's kind of like you have to build a reputation of saying only important things. That's a good way, to, way place to start. Just be quiet. Yeah, yeah. And not only like exactly, exactly what you said, that added thing, which you kind of actually may have already said. But when you sit back and just listen to them, it'll cause you to have to say less. Because what if you wanted to like, oh, I was going to make this point. That's the feeling you get when you want to interrupt someone like, oh, I want to make this point right mm-hmm. now kind of thing. You will find out, you just let people talk. You don't have to make that point. Mm-hmm. They know this they stuff already, already you know, yeah. all that. And you'll find that's probably a lot of the time, you know? So yeah. you. It, and by the way, if I step in to make a point that people already know, how impactful is that point? It's, yeah, it's a very point. limited yeah. impact. Mm-hmm. So the more points that you can hear that you know and that everyone knows and that you don't have to say, the better off you are. So when you do make a point, and it's a point that no one really thought of, how impactful is that point? Yeah. The answer is it's very impactful. Yeah, and it comes way more clear that it might be a point that no one thought of after you listen to everyone talk for however long. Then it's like, oh, wait, this wasn't covered, so I can say this. I don't have to say all these other things that I was probably going to interrupt with or whatever. Yeah, just be quiet, right? Just be quiet. And in social situations, for example, to me, and this is what I kind of started doing, or tried to start doing in social situations, you know how like, okay, I listen to my wife and her friends talking there. It's just a boom, boom, interrupting, interrupting. It's not rude or nothing. Mm-hmm. It's just cause they're just talking yeah. and yeah, that's, that's you know, how they roll. Yeah. That's how they roll. And to the point where I'm getting like little mild micro doses of uh, anxiety because of all the interruptions. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, a lot. They just talk a lot. That's what it is. Um, anyway. So, um, I found in social situations, if I feel that, like if I'm like trying to talk or that I'm getting interrupted a lot, a lot, man, in a way, they don't really care that much about what you have to say. They have more like they care more about what they have to say. And it's a social situation. So, yeah, you might as well just be quiet. You're adding less value interrupting their valuable stuff, you know, so just be quiet. And you'll find that they'll want to talk to you more, too, if you be quiet and not interrupt them. You might have to take some heavies on the interruption front, though, because that is kind of annoying if you pay attention to it. That's what I think. <laughs> I, see, I see what you're doing right now. <laughs> Next question. I saw your TED talk. I, like most people, have a boss. If it wasn't the fault of the guys below you and there are people above you, shouldn't they take ownership, i.e. your commanding officer and then it, in turn his? Why would ownership only drift halfway up? So in an ideal world, ownership goes up and down the chain of command. Absolutely. And that is how problems get solved because people take ownership of those problems throughout the chain of command. Now, does the world always work like that? No, it doesn't. And that's okay. That's fine. Because as the boss of what you're the boss of, you can't make any excuses. That's the way it happens. And... and when an organization is taking ownership, when you've got a team where everyone is taking ownership on that team, there's absolutely overlap of 
everyone taking responsibility for the different problems there'll be some overlap well, I could have done this to help out oh yeah and I would have done this better and now the we both solved the same problem but it's it's redundant but good because now we got two people addressing the problem yeah. so that's not a bad thing so when people are taking ownership up and down the chain of command the problems are getting not just uh, not just solved by one angle but by multiple different angles of everyone that's taking ownership of of that problem mm. when the blue on blue happened in it, that I talk about extreme ownership that was in the TED talk and I, I talk about this like my guys took ownership of what they did wrong as well the guy that d- shot the the Iraqi soldier the radio man took Ownership of the fact that he didn't pass the word quick enough the element leader took ownership of the fact that the the Iraqis had gotten away from him They all owned their little pieces and of course I owned it as well and When I took ownership of everything it wasn't like those guys then said "Oh, okay Well, then I'm absolved and I don't have to change anything. No, no, no those guys still realized that they made some mistakes and some things that they needed to clean up. So I took ownership of the same thing they were taking ownership of, and guess what? Then again, it was redundant that we were all trying to solve the problems. Mm. Now, this is the opposite. This doesn't happen. When you start blaming people, everyone makes excuses. Mm-hmm. That's just the way it works. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that that's what you have to think about. So, so like I said, ideally, when a leader takes ownership, so do the people up and down the chain of command they also take ownership of the problems that if they do that's great and the leader can then monitor what those people up and down the chain of command do to fix the problem mm-hmm. and if they fix the problems then that's great that's the way it works and if they don't fix the problems then that's when the leader has to own it up and down the chain of command and still be responsible and take ownership of fixing the problem so the other piece of this, I guess, is that that's why extreme ownership works. It works because people that don't take ownership, again, up or down the chain of command, they will be they will they will end up being overrun by the people that take ownership. It might not happen immediately, but eventually the people that make excuses will be overrun by the people that take ownership. That's the way it works. And by the way, and again, I talked about this in the TED Talk, when that whole thing happened and I took ownership of it, my boss then trusted me more, not less. Mm. And that's that's what happens. You end up increasing your trust. So, So take ownership. Yeah. If your boss takes ownership too, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That means you've got multiple people trying to solve the problem, yeah. which is good for the team. <laughs> yeah. You guys get asked this a lot. For some reason, Leif gets asked this a lot, where it, it's a lot, a lot. Like almost every single time I see Leif in a question answering situation, he's, they say, what do I do or what happens when my boss isn't taking ownership? Or what do I do when my whatever isn't taking ownership? The question is ultimately, what do I do when the other guy Mm -hmm. isn't taking ownership, right? And see how you're smiling right now because it's like so obvious, you know? Essentially, that's what this is. I mean, he's not in the scenario, so it's not, you know, but, and how you guys always say, it's like, well, the the thing is, extreme ownership isn't about the other guy taking Mm -hmm. ownership or not taking ownership. It's about everything you can personally do to take ownership. that's it. They, yep. It stops right there. Now, just like you said, if everyone else is taking ownership, which will happen because it's kind of this weird contagious kind of thing. Yeah. And and I don't want to throw it out there like, oh, if I take ownership, then everyone's automatically right, right. taking ownership. That yes. doesn't happen because yeah, there'll be people the that don't. Yeah. There's some people that are not looking to take ownership. And again, those are the people that will eventually get overrun. Yes. Because who do you want working for you? The guy that says, oh, this wasn't my fault. It wasn't someone else. Do you want that guy working for you? Because that person's not going to change. They're not going to do anything different. They're not going to get that problem solved. You want the person working for you that says, you know what? This is my fault. This is what I'm going to do to fix it. Here we go. Yeah. You go, okay, well, I'll let you continue to do your job. And, and I want you to continue to do your job. And by the way, when a promotion opportunity comes up, guess who I'm promoting? Yep. The guy that makes a bunch of excuses and blames other people or the guy that takes ownership and gets problem solved. Yep. There you go. It's yeah. a no-brainer. And I think as people see that in an organization, the majority of people, now this I will say, the majority of people, 
they will also take ownership. Yeah. There will be a minority of people that go, oh, well, I'm going to slough off and I'm going to yeah. keep blaming other people. And in their minds, they think they look good, right? right in my mind, they, when I go, it's, it's well, it wasn't my fault. It was Echo's fault. Mm. I think I saved myself from yeah. the blame. <laughs> what I really did was look like an excuse-making little baby. Yeah. And I don't want to promote me. Yeah. Because like, no, it wasn't my fault. Oh, the podcast didn't come out. It wasn't my fault. It was Echo's fault. Yeah. Well, really? Okay. Well, let's let's think about that. Do you want who's who's responsible? I'm sh- shirking the responsibility and laying it on some other person. I don't want that person working for me. Mm-hmm. No. So that's why it works. Yeah. And don't I was scared s- of it. People are scared that well, if I take the blame, I'm going to look bad. Don't be, you look bad when you don't take the blame. Yeah. That's when you look bad. Yeah. Pretty much any time in one way or another, pretty much any time you look at other people and be like, "Hey, what about them?" you know? In this extreme ownership situation, like the it's like it goes against the very nature of extreme ownership to to ask like, hey, what about them? Why didn't they take responsibility? Yeah. Just like I mean, back to the question is kind of like just to kind of get a handle on understanding what extreme ownership is. If you start to incorporate, hey, what about them? Hey, what about the higher ups? Why should the ownership stop at you? Well, here's the thing: it doesn't begin. It begins and stops stops at me. Mm-hmm. That's one hundred percent of what it is. Now. Other people, I mean, if I can step out of my own situation of extreme and just kind of evaluate other people when they see you or feel you or see you taking ownership of stuff, I think it tends to be contagious. Like, yes. even no, absolutely. That's like, what I just said. The majority of people, when yeah. you take ownership, when I take ownership of something, if I go echo, you know what? This is my fault that the podcast didn't come out or whatever. This yeah, is yeah. my fault that we didn't get this done. You, your tendency isn't to go. Oh, cool. It's Jocko's fault. Yeah, I agree with you. It's your, no, and you go, no, man, I should have done this or I should have done that. And yeah. now, once again, we're both trying to solve the problem. Yeah. That's the way it usually ends up. Yeah. Real interesting how, like, um, Jamie, I, you know, I email with Jamie. You're Jamie. Mm-hmm. That's fun. fun. Uh, and she'll, like, I'll make some mistake, you know, on the spelling of something, mm-hmm. on some video, I don't know, something. And she'll, she's real good at taking ownership. Yeah. She's like, oh, you know, I should have, you know, whatever, whatever. And to the point, sometimes, like, I see what you're doing. And yeah. it's true. It's like any feeling of, like, oh, oh, I should, you know, excuse making or whatever. <clears throat> any feeling of that, gone. When someone is like, oh, no, no, it's my yeah. fault. I should have caught that. Or, what, what do you mean you should have caught that? I should have caught yeah. that. I made the video kind of thing, kind of thing. But, it's, man, it works. So, like, it, it's real contagious, I think. It Even people who are just naturally defensive, you know, you know, because people are different, you know. I think over time they tend to be – when when they kind of build this kind of – when everyone builds a reputation of not blaming, it's like they, they – they let that natural guard down and they tend look over time, you know, even mm-hmm. if they at first they don't want to check. Next question. What are some ways to get out of a rut in jujitsu? We're just talking about this off air. I always get caught in the same spot cross side and can't move. What should I do? This is a brutal answer, but the truth. Sure. If you have a hard time in a certain position, start there every time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> start with a person across the si- across the side until you get used to it. And then on top of starting there and you start working your techniques, learn some new escapes. Because whatever you're doing right now isn't working. Yeah. So learn some new excuse- escapes. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to learn 47 escapes. But if you've got your one go-to escape and it's not working... There's a, actually, there's a pretty good chance if you only know one escape from something, it's not going to work. Because yeah. one escape, then the, guess what the person has to defend? One thing. one thing. And so they stop it. So learn, you know, three escapes total, maybe four escapes total. And these are escapes that must be escapes that kind of chain together, which most of the time they do. So you learn, the, and you know, you can ask, you can ask, obviously you can ask your instructor. You can ask some of the other students that, that you see get out, how did you do that? You can even go look at YouTube and Google cross side escapes and get some good ideas from there. And then you're gonna have to take risks while you try your new escapes in, you can drill them of course, but then eventually you're gonna have to try them live because when you do something in a drill, it is not the same as doing it live. It, it's There are adjustments that need to be made and things that you need to f- figure out and you're not gonna be successful the first 100 times or 50 times, or 28 times, or 420 times that you try something. Yep. You, you, there's a lot of little things you gotta figure out, and you're gonna get caught in some of those times. You're gonna try something new and you're gonna get caught. So, take risks, and try your escapes, 
another point, and I've probably talked about this before, specifically, cross-eyed, don't wait Mm -hmm. until the person settles in before you start your escape. And this is true with anything, right? This is true with life. Don't wait until you're, if you see a bad position coming, don't wait until the position, don't wait until the bad thing actually fully happens to you. Mm -hmm. No, start to defend it before it settles in on you. Mm -hmm. Get a bad scenario coming down the line, start to aggressively counter that bad thing, what whatever it is, before it actually b- gets you. Mm. And if you can do that, then you will be, I, I guarantee that, that's that's a lot of the problem right there. Because, mm. because g- g- you know why? Because getting out of a cross side is a really hard position to get out of, I don't care who you are, I have a hard time. Yep. When Dean gets a cross side on me, it is hard to get out. Yes, sir, like, yes. I mean, it. It's really hard to get out. Yeah. So what does that mean? Yeah, that's a dominant position. And that's the last thing is like you have to take some risks to get out. Sometimes you got to break the rules Mm. to get out. You got to do something. You got to offer up a possible submission to them that you know is coming. You know, there's some things that you can do like that. Mm. But um, escaping before the situation has occurred to you is a very positive thing you could do that with anything like you yeah. you're in a relationship you see something bad coming down the you see a, a human being you're in a relationship with and you see that the relationship is going in a bad direction yeah. if you try and f- either fix it or end it before the thing goes sideways that's the smart thing to do yeah. don't wait until everything's a disaster and yeah. you've got to <laughs> You got to go and get the restraining order or whatever, <laughs> right? You're calling yes. the cops because you got someone that's acting irrational. Don't wait until that p- p- moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Solve the problem as early as possible <gasps> is the point. Yeah, I agree. So that's how you get out of that little rut. Yeah, that what you said um, in the beginning of the, the start in bad, that bad situation. That that's mm. a huge help. And I don't I don't know if all academies do this, but I mean Dean has always done this. Where before you do open matter, the live rolling, whatever, like right before that, there's a uh, part where it's essentially situational training. Yeah, you know, you go start side control. We're gonna go for yep. two minutes or minute and a half, whatever. Uh, one guy on top, one guy on bottom, obviously. And if you get out, restart. Exactly same right. Spot, yeah, yeah the, you know the guy, top guy's trying to submit the bottom guy. Yep. The bottom guy's trying to escape. If the bottom guy escapes. You start all over. Yeah. That's it. And the other point to that is if you get submitted, it doesn't count. Exactly right. Like it's like, hey, yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm trying new things. I'm taking risks. So mm-hmm. I expect you. I I actually expect that you're going to get submitted yeah. because you're trying new things. If you, In fact, if you don't get submitted, you fail because you, you didn't try something new that was really oh, yeah, risky. Yeah, if you're see, just staying yeah, there, I'll just say, stay yeah. There. yeah, that's not what that drill's for. And you can feel it too. Yeah. You know, like, okay, sure, the guy tapped me out. You don't want him to tap you out, but you're there to escape. That's it. You know, so it's not about like winning this match or losing this round or whatever, you know, you're, you're and then you get so familiar with being inside control. Mm-hmm. So when you do go live roll, you're like, oh, I'm familiar because I've done this situation no drill full speed, by the way, it's a full speed drill. And yeah, you're just so familiar with that position. So not only are you more comfortable, you know, those different escapes that you've learned, you know, earlier that day or whatever, whenever you learned them and then then you can execute them way better. You get know? comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. But that helped, man. That helps so much. Those those situational sparring drills. Next question. Jocko. There are no bad teams, only bad leaders. Do you think there are exceptions to this? If so, how do you know you're a part of the exception? That is a quote from the book Extreme Ownership written by myself and my brother Leif Babin. Sure. And it is a quote that... I don't want to say we stole, but we stole. We appropriated sure. from David Hackworth, who said there's no bad, I think he said no bad officers, no bad units, only bad officers, mm-hmm. and Napoleon, who said there's no bad regiments, only bad colonels, mm-hmm. and we said there's no bad teams, only bad leaders, and the question is, is there an exception to this, mm-hmm. and how do you know if you're part of the exception? Well, actually, there is. There's a big exception to this. And the exception is that there are bad leaders with good teams. <laughs> that is true. That can happen. Sometimes you get a bad leader that is running a really, really good team. So that's an exception. To, I guess it's an exception to this rule. Maybe. That's the way I took it. Uh, so you get a team that's so good that they just continue to perform. Even though they have a horrible leader, they perform 
despite their bad leader. Gotcha. Now, what this doesn't, this does not prove, you know, I always say leadership is the most important thing on the battlefield. This doesn't disprove that statement. Mm. You'd think maybe it does because, oh, well, you got a bad leader and you got a good team, then maybe leadership isn't that important. That's wrong. Actually, what it proves is that leadership can come from any level inside the organization. That's what yeah. it proves. And it proves that because I've seen that over and over again when I was running the training for the SEAL platoons. Eventually, I didn't care where the leadership in the platoon was because I realized that it was a real, it was a real hard thing to hope for that you had the person that was in the leadership positions, like the platoon commander or the platoon chief, to to assume or to figure that they were going to be the leader that you wanted them to be was a big assumption to make. Mm-hmm. And so what I realized after training for a while is like, even though I wanted the leaders to be those senior guys who were supposed to be taking leadership, eventually I realized as I, I didn't care where that leadership came from. As long as there was a couple of good leaders, you would end up with a good SEAL platoon and the platoon would be on track. Now, maybe the question is what this person is hinting at the exception being, is there an exception that if there's a bad team, maybe that team is just so filled with bad people that they can't get the job done? That's the kind of exception he's talking about. We're failing because the team is so bad. Even though the leader is good. Even though saying? the leader's good, but the right. team is so, so bad, bad yeah. Yeah. that that's an exception to the rule. Yeah. Well, guess what? Who's responsible for the people <laughs> on the team? Who's responsible for training the people on the team so that they can get good at their job and they can perform with excellence? Or who's in charge of getting rid of the people that are subpar so that the team steps up their performance? Well, the answer to all those questions is the leader. So if you're on a bad team and you're leading the team, it's your fault. And there's no exceptions to that. Yeah. Zero. Yeah, I'm over here trying to think of the exception, but just what you said, it's like uh, it kind of yeah, kind of negates any. Hey, excuse. this this let's take a real a real simple example of like a sports team, right? Oh, the sports team got dealt a bad hand, and now the people on the team. Well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna train those people. Who's responsible? For that? I'm not saying you're gonna per- start performing right now, but mm-hmm. you can get on the trajectory where you'll be good eventually. Yeah. Now, if you just blame, hey, I got a bad team, well, guess what? Then you don't put any effort. Guess what? You're going to continue right. to be a loser. I'm the exception. Yeah, my, bad my, team. Team, my team is just so bad. Yeah. yeah Train your people. I'm not saying you're a miracle worker. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying you can, you can take people that don't have any skills and instantly, through your leadership, turn them into incredible performers. Yeah. No, that, that's not going to happen. But guess what? As a leader, you go out and you bring people into your team that are good. Go, You do train the people that you do have up to the best of their abilities. And the people that can't perform the way they need to perform, you get rid of them. Yeah. yeah that's it. No real exceptions. Other than, yeah, you can have a good team with bad leaders. Yeah. If, Only because there's but, good leaders somewhere in there. You know, the exceptions thing, I, I think it's healthy, in my opinion. No. In regards to this and most other things where if if I or we start thinking that we're the exception so we don't have to put in like, I don't know, like the work or whatever, not necessarily the work, but the, you know, how like, okay, we'll take this one. No bad teams, only bad leader, leaders. But, uh, you know, if I say I might be the exception to this because my team is so bad, it's kind of like, just aren't you kind of, yeah, aren't you kind of doing sure. a little cop out there kind of thing? You 100% are. If the bottom line is if you don't take ownership of what's going on, then you're not going to perform well. Yeah. If you just blame your genetics, then that means okay. Well, then I'm not going to get in any kind of shape whatsoever. Then guess what? Guess what kind of shape you're being? Junk. Substandard. Substandard. Yeah. Next question. Jocko, leadership is knowing when to cut someone loose that can't perform in a team. But do you have any techniques for trying to help people who lack common sense get better? in the name of just trying to make the world a better place, obviously without being a jerk. My my common answer in situations like this, and you've heard it before, mm-hmm. is to pick, put them in charge of something, right? You got someone that's that's doesn't have a lot of common sense, pick something that's maybe just outside their level of competency and put them in charge of it. 
it's something that doesn't put too much at risk so you can give them some room to make some decisions and some mistakes without doing too much damage Mm -hmm. and then you coach them you monitor them and you coach them and you you coach them not just on what decision to make but more important how to make that decision so if you think about what common sense is if you break it down right if you break down what common sense is common sense is like a blanket term that we don't really relate it to what it really means but it's a blanket term that covers a person's sort of natural ability to make good decisions mm. that's what that's what common sense essentially is sure. right because you don't look at someone someone makes a bad decision and you say that person has no common sense yeah someone makes a good decision or continually makes good decisions I think that person's got a lot of a lot of common sense yeah. so what we're really talking about is their ability to make decisions mm. so when you're trying to help someone increase their common sense what you're really trying to do is improve their decision making process so some things to look at when it comes to improving your decision-making process, number one, learn how to step back and detach. That's that's number one. You can't make good decisions when you're all embroiled in the in the gunfight. Mm. Learn how to analyze and assess and create different courses of action. Some people only see one way. Mm. And when you only see one way and you can't detach, you never open up your mind to see that there could possibly be other ways. Mm -hmm. You have to, in order to have good common sense slash make good decisions, you have to understand how to look at and understand what the consequences of your actions are going to be. And that includes second and third order effects because a lot of times when people oh, that guy has no common sense because they do something that to them makes sense at that moment they right. don't understand what the consequences are they don't understand the second third order effects and so it ends up being a bad decision and we just throw out like oh the guy's got no common sense yeah to make a good decision you have to know how to mitigate risk mm-hmm. that's also very important to make a good decision you have to understand what your assets are and what kind of resources you have even on a simple decision even on a quote common sense decision you have to understand what you have at hand to help you execute whatever decision you make Mm -hmm. you have to this is a big one you have to learn if you want to make good decisions you have to understand that you're going to make some assumptions and you have to analyze those assumptions and see which ones make sense to make and which ones are not sensible to make because obviously and there's that old there's that old saying about assumptions don't assume because it makes an ass out of you and me that's a that's a a a pretty realistic saying it's a pretty good saying to keep in the back of your mind Mm -hmm. if you make assumptions on things however that being said if you make no assumptions well then you can never move forward on most things because right. you got to assume like okay most of the time this is probably what's going to happen and you can go forward with that so the list go you know the list goes on and 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 on and what you need to do is as you give these people a little bit of room and a little bit of responsibility and a little bit of decision making in their life like you could do with your kids right hmm. you give your kids the opportunity to make a decision and and if they make a bad decision and all you do is smack them do yep. without explaining to them the process the decision making process mm-hmm. which is where that decision came from then they're never going to gain more common sense and you know when you when you think about the list i think detachment is actually the most important thing mm-hmm. and i think what happens the people that don't have common sense they 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 actually don't have the ability at that time because they haven't been trained properly to see things from an outside perspective yeah but have you ever noticed when somebody does something that's completely lack the complete lack of common sense when you raise the point to them they're always kind of like astonished <laughs> <laughs> that like they don't even get mm. why what they did was dumb mm. they just think that that's just how it was gonna be yeah. and they don't even understand that what they did was dumb yeah. And sometimes you have to actually explain to people that they're so ingr- they're so embedded in their decision making process They can't see it from an external perspective. So they don't even understand how dumb their decision was. Yeah, 
if you can get them some level of detachment, then you're moving them in the right direction. You're improving their common sense. And yes, when you're doing that, to your credit, you're actually making the world a better place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, they get, and you kind of said this anyway, but you give them, them experience, you know, like when you let them like make, make For sure. more decisions. Because really, that's really what common sense is, right? If you have or don't have common sense, it's like if you have a lot of experience, common sense is like you're a little bit more in touch with it than someone with very little experience. So let's say, I mean, it's culturally, we'll say. So in, in Hawaii, everyone takes off their shoes when they go in the house. That's mm-hmm. just how. And... Uh, you know, in the mainland, it's not like that. So if I've never been to Hawaii, I have no experience in Hawaii, but, you know, in the, in the, I've lived in the mainland the whole time, but if I don't have any access to the, you know, Hawaii culture or whatever. Mm-hmm. I go to Hawaii, I'm going to leave my shoes on. You know, it, it's like common sense, man. You take off your shoes if you've only lived in Hawaii the whole time, right? Now, it's, you could argue, hey, all you got to do is look around and mm-hmm. see. But, bro, I don't, I'm not trained to look around to see what everyone's wearing and not wearing. You know, like yeah. bro, well, sometimes weird. Do you ever notice? I would say once a month at the gym, someone walks on the mat with shoes on, like just not even. Yeah. When it's there's they're literally stepping over a, a big pile or line of of, of, of flip flops and yeah, shoes yeah, to yeah. get to get on the mat, yeah. and they're just no factor. They're right. just stepping over with their street shoes on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's a the exact. And you would think yeah. common sense would tell you. Hey, it looks like every single person, there's 28 people on the mat, none of them are wearing shoes, and I'm stepping over. You'd yeah. think, but that's a person that doesn't have common sense. Right. Well, so what you have to do with a person like that, when you see someone that does that kind of thing, you know, let's say your kid did that. Mm-hmm. You'd say, hey, instead of just going, hey, take off your shoes, you know, you go, hey, before you do something, look around at the environment. Right. Take a look around. What do you see? Yeah. You see all these people on the mat, none of them wearing shoes, and you look right in front of your feet, and there's all these shoes off the mat, that probably indicates that you should take off your shoes. That should yeah. be a good decision. It should be, but and the, but now you're going into yet another different type of experience. Like if you're in a, in scenarios often where you were looking around and seeing what other people are doing and wearing, like and all, and all this stuff. If you're in co- constantly in situation in situations like that, that will become more part of your common sense, right? Yeah. But so it's like to say, I mean, there are plenty of people who in r- normal everyday life have normal common sense like everyone else, who would wear shoes on the mat. They just simply would because they don't. Hey, these guys are training. They're not going to wear shoes while they're training, so they took off their shoes. I'm not training. I'm just going to go talk to this guy over here. Boom! I'm rolling with the shoes on the mat, just like oh, I've never been to Hawaii. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go in this house. There, they live here. They maybe he just got out of bed. Maybe they just want to be comfortable because they got out of work. I don't know. I don't. It's, it doesn't go through the thought process of my common sense. My common sense is, if I don't have to take off my shoes for something specific. I'm not going to do it. That's just how. That's just my common experience, you know? So the common sense is kind of a situational thing, you know? It's not just cut and dry. He has common sense versus not. So you put him in more experience that's common to the group. Oh, man, his common sense goes up. Fair enough. I think so. (laughs) I think so. Next question. I've been told by employees that I'm cold and non-engaging. My peers say I charge hell with a bucket of water and sometimes get to stop or for, sometimes forget to stop and fill the bucket in military training. We all went through the mental part and in battle, some won't engage properly. I treat my business the same, the same way as I fought in a firefight. My mind was clear, focused on the objective and being aggressive always. Why should my business be any different? Delegate and don't quit until you accomplish the goal. Is this wrong? So let's start with cold and non-engaging. I get that people have different levels of emotional responsiveness. I I get that. I'm probably a little bit on the low end of that in terms of being super emotionally responsive. Agree. I don't really get mad. I don't usually get frustrated. But at the same time, as a leader, you have to show some emotion. And if you show no emotion at all, then you aren't a person, you're a robot, and robots don't really connect with people, and so you don't form any relationships, and if you don't form good relationships, you're not gonna have a good 
leadership connection with your team. That's the way it is. So you got to show some emotions. You, you don't need to get all wild. And in fact, as a leader, your emotions should be controlled. They should be, you know, if, if a normal person's emotions go from one to ten, a leader should be like, you know, at three, maybe four. Mm. And they shouldn't go beyond that. Mm. And I've talked about this before. If, if, some, if my team's getting all emotional and I'm just all cold, I, I actually disconnect from my team. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're looking at me like I'm, I'm not one of them. Yeah, That's a bad care. thing. Yeah, it doesn't even care. Same thing with your, with your spouse. If you, yes, your spouse is all mad about something and you're like, hey, just calm down, you're, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. You, have to, you have to give them some emotions back. So show some emotions as a leader. You might even have to you know, manufacture that just a little <laughs> bit to, to let them see that you care. You know, you, you got to do that with your kids sometimes. Yes. You know, because like your kid is doing something that you know they shouldn't be doing, but it's kind of funny. And it's hard to get mad at, yeah. but you realize if you don't get mad and this this behavior escalates, yeah. then that's problematic. Yeah. Like, are you kind of fired up when your kid does something, climbs up on a wall and is balancing, you know, eight feet in the air? Well, if mm. they fall and crack their head, that's gonna be a problem. Yeah. At the same time, you think it's kind of cool, but <laughs> yes. you have to reinforce safety. Yeah. And so you gotta be like a little bit angry at them, yeah. right? Hey. Hey, I told you not to do that, right? Yeah. Kid running in the row or whatever. You gotta you gotta reinforce stuff. Yeah. So it's okay. You, you actually have to show some level of emotions. Now, as far as the other part of the question is aggression and never quitting, is that wrong? Well, you know, quite frankly, yes. Yes, it, it can be very wrong. <laughs> Of course, much of what the statement is, it, it makes sense, right? Be aggressive, don't quit, focus on the objective. Charge into hell with a vengeance, right? We all like to hear that, right? That reflects a great attitude. I think everyone would expect me and they would actually hear me say those things. The same exact things, they want to be aggressive, we're never gonna quit, we're gonna take that objective no matter what. You would hear me say that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have to remember that there are dichotomies in leadership, right? And taking what is a normally, what is normally a good attitude to an absolute extreme without any balance at all, that will turn into a problem. So it sounds like this individual is aggressive, which is a very positive trait, but it sounds like perhaps there are times when this individual might be too aggressive. Now, most people don't want to hear that and they don't think they're gonna hear that from me right you almost think when somebody asks me a question like this you almost think in their back of their mind they're going you know what jock was gonna tell me and I'm gonna go even harder yeah yeah right I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them. reinforcement right. from Jocko about how being aggressive mm. is awesome but here's the reality and especially if you throw like the, the firefight thing like Jocko's definitely gonna be on board with me now mm -hmm. but guess what here's the reality if you're in a firefight and the enemy is in an elevated bunker position across open ground and you just keep attacking it with your platoon what's gonna happen I'll tell you what's gonna happen you're all gonna die that's what's gonna happen mm -hmm. so you, you're all fired up you're all aggressive you're never gonna quit and you're all gonna die mm -hmm. Does that help us? Does that help us achieve our overall strategic objective? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. If you pull back for a minute, if you detach for a, a moment mentally and possibly physically as well, you will likely see that there's a better approach. <laughs> well, how about we call for fire support? Mm -hmm. How about we put down some cover, lay down some suppressive fire and move around to the flank of the bunkered position? There's a bunch of different ways that you can get this done in a much more survivable way. Mm. But the fact is, if you're always aggressive and your mindset is, I am not gonna quit, then you won't see those other solutions. And yes, that is problematic. Yes, that is wrong. And it's the same thing in dealing with people. Mm. If, if people don't respond to your leadership and your reaction to that is just to get more and more aggressive with them, they aren't likely to come around, yeah. right? In fact, they are likely to either become hostile towards you because you're being aggressive towards them, or they break. Yeah. 
which each one of those is problematic, bad, bad results. Either my team becomes hostile towards me or I break my team. Mm-hmm. Either way, it's bad. So th- being aggressive all the time, no, not good. And same thing, same thing could be like, like I, I default aggressive, right? I literally teach people to, to be that way. Mm. But if you go too far with it, you'll end up in a bad situation. Same thing with don't quit, right? Mm. Of course, of course, don't quit. Great attitude, my attitude is I'm never gonna quit. Mm. I want everyone on my team to have that attitude. I have that attitude. Mm. That's like the the saying in, in the SEAL teams, don't quit, never quit. Mm-hmm. But you have to be very, very careful that you don't confuse don't quit with don't try any other solutions <laughs> <laughs> or don't deviate from the original plan no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm not quitting. I'm just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Right. I'm going to keep going forward with the same plan. The plan isn't working. Yeah. Okay, but I'm not a quitter. I'm just going to keep doing the same plan. Right. That's right. not good. Mm-hmm. That's not good. Don't quit means you don't give up. It actually, don't quit actually means try different solutions if one of them isn't working. Don't quit means keep an open mind. Don't quit means you don't quit thinking. (laughs) Don't think, don't quit thinking. And then don't quit means you continue to keep thinking and keep addressing a problem and keep attacking the problem until you do accomplish the mission. But you do that through multiple different avenues, not the same avenue the whole time. That's how you lead. That's how you get aggressive. That's how you actually never quit. And by the way, that is how you win. Amen. Yeah, that morale thing. Remember, you were, you were talking about morale. Mm-hmm. Actually, a lot. Where, you know, how like some bosses, they'll be like, hey, I'm not here to make you feel good, or I'm not here to make friends, or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes like behavior or whatever, thinking like that can lead to behavior that makes people like not want to work for you or not feel good about the job. Like, I'm not happy about like it. What's the use of making someone do the job if they don't feel good about doing it? You know, like the, the morale is down. I used to think, well, morale, like people need to just toughen up, you know, mm-hmm. like freaking morality. You you don't just not do something just because you're not feeling good that day kind of kind of thing. I thought that, too. But, man, if you have a group of people who they all don't want to do it, yeah, they're not going to do it. It's a problem. At the end of the day, they're going to not do it well they might do that one thing that day yeah i mean well, yeah, over time the they're gonna break down for sure yeah you're not leading them in the in the right direction yeah you can, you can look forcing people to do things when you're in a posi- position of authority you can do that yeah that works that's functional that's a thing it'll work a little yeah. bit yeah right but over time will you end up with a team that really will perform well and will continue to drive when they hit obstacles no you won't you'll yeah. end up with a team that's doing what they're being told to do out of fear yeah and that team is gonna get beat by the team that is doing it because they want to do it yeah yeah so if it's like you know the guy who you know they I don't think that my boss cares about me in fact I think that he kind of doesn't care about me that's what I think you're not gonna do a lot of extra effort to yeah. support your boss if that's I'm sure the situation. Won't, won't want to next question Jocko do you talk about build, or you talk about building relationships a lot at work, even when people whom you might not like, even with people whom you, you don't like? Have you always been this way, or did you also feel difficult? Yeah, also feel difficulty. difficulty in wanting to build relationships with those people. If the latter, what are the things that help you to actually want to build relationships with them? Thanks. So. When I was a young seal, I was pretty typical young seal, pretty typical young man, sure. meaning I thought I was invincible. I thought I could beat everyone in a fight because I didn't know jujitsu, so you just think you're just going to win, but that you're wrong. <laughs> I thought I knew everything, of course, mm. and I thought I was smarter than everyone else. Kind of typical. Sometimes I would rub people the wrong way. 
and the people that I would rub the wrong way were especially people that I th- thought were not squared away in the chain of command. So if you weren't square, if you if you were my boss and I didn't think you were squared away, yeah. I was going to rub you the wrong way because no. I was going to be slightly offensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I got an evaluation. It's one of the first evaluations that I got when I got to a SEAL team. Mm-hmm. And back in the day, yeah, you'd get you were rated four point. Zero was the highest you could get, and it would go all the way down to whatever, like one. Mm. But at this time, ba- basically everyone got four zero and everything, right? Mm. You basically got four zero and everything. Yeah, yeah. And like you'd have to mess up. You have to mess to, up to get deviate from the four zero. So I got all four zeros, and I got a three point eight, which was like a major <laughs> dig. Sure. And the dig was in, I think it was like in. Relation like I, I don't know what the word was, but when I got debriefed on it What the guy that gave me the three eight what he what he told me? <laughs> which I actually was proud of because that's how stupid I was <laughs> he's like sure. you you're you're too hostile with people that aren't squared away That's literally what Dang, he told me you figured it out. and I was all like whatever <laughs> You're damn right I am hostile towards people that aren't squared away. I'm here to go to war. Yeah. Right? Just an mm-hmm. idiot. That's what that's what the situation was. And you know, it made me mad if a leader was weak and I would form these antagonistic relationships with leaders if I thought that they were weak. Mm-hmm. And one of these bosses eventually that I thought I was better than mm-hmm. right? I thought I was smarter thought I was smarter than him right I thought that he was an idiot sure. I should have his job right how often do you think that right mm-hmm. I should have that guy's job I'm better yeah, than them. Yeah. I'm smarter than them yeah, yeah. and the more I showed this attitude the worse our relationship got and the l- and the less he listened to me and the less influence I had over how we did things mm-hmm. and therefore the the worse we did and the and the the worse our ability to perform got because he was just doing things the way he thought without any good input from anyone below him in the chain of command mm. all because i had formed this antagonistic relationship with him which was bad mm. cuz then he's not listening to me and then one day one day i said to myself if i'm so smart if I'm such a smart guy, why am I losing? <laughs> why am I losing? If I'm so smart, if I am so smart, why can't I get this guy to do what I want him to do? Even though he's my boss, doesn't matter. If I'm so smart, yeah, and I'm so him. much smarter than him, mm-hmm. why can't I get him to do what I want him to do? Why, if I'm so smart, how come I can't have more influence over the way we operate? If I'm so smart and he's so dumb. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's when I realized, that's when I had an awakening. <laughs> an awakening that instead of blaming him for being stupid, I was the one who was being stupid. I had lost the ability to influence my boss because I was being stupid and because of my ego. I, I literally thought I deserved his job. I mean, I thought pretty much anyone should, anyone in the platoon should have his job. <laughs> and therefore, since I thought that, I, inst- I undermined him. Instead of supporting him, instead of building a relationship with him, I undermined him. Now, once I got humble and I started to build a positive relationship with him instead of an antagonistic one that started to change and because because then he started listening to me he started to change some things and my influence over the whole situation became better because I now had a relationship with, despite the fact that I didn't really like the guy despite that fact I built the relationship and the situation got better I had more influence and that became kind of my standard operating procedure was to build relationships with people even if I didn't like them to build relationships with people so that I could have more influence now does what does that sound like right that sounds like 
I'm kind of this manipulative, yeah, yeah. two-faced, superficial, disingenuous guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's being devious and conniving. Not keeping it real. Not keeping it real, right? But the fact is, that is not true. That's not, that's not, that's not who I am. You want to know who I am? I'm a guy that's trying to accomplish the mission. That's what I am. I'm a guy that is trying to accomplish the mission who is putting my own ego in check to build a relationship with someone that I don't like, that I don't respect, but what I'm trying to do is improve our operational capability. That's what's more important to me. Trying to arrange the situation, build the relationship so that we do better. Not so that I get promoted, not so that I'm getting some accolades, but so that we as a team do a better job. Put the little feelings aside because I want the team to win. So if you're having having some trouble getting over your feelings and getting over your ego to build relationships for the good of the team, ask yourself the same question I asked myself a long time ago, which is this. If I am so smart, why am I not winning? And if you answer that question honestly, then you'll put your ego in check. You'll go build the relationships that will make you and your team accomplish the mission and win. Hmm. There you go. Can't help but agree with that one. <laughs> you know what? You know what's funny is we think about like why you wouldn't like someone. Mm-hmm. What what causes you to not like someone? Most of the time, that's your ego, anyways. Yeah. Most of the time. That's your ego anyways. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you you had that story of the, the, the you know, you were consulting somebody mm-hmm. who was like a big CEO of a yeah, company, yeah, yeah. So like a lacrosse guy. That story is probably the most common story. I mean, the way you handle it, different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that yeah. scenario that you started with, with that's so common, man, where, yeah, they rub you the wrong way because right off the bat, you see them as some kind of competitive figure yep. to you. Like yep. they're, you know, some, you know, compet- you know you're know, you c- competing with them in your own mind, in whatever. And the feeling's probably mutual a lot of the time, you know, so you guys don't like each other. You know, one, anything he says, you're, you know, yep. you're already defensive. But it's weird, man, how you can... How that happened, like that's happened to me before. Mm -hmm. Not as, it wasn't as overt, but just like, yeah, I don't really feel that guy. You know, I don't like, I would, because I, not only is he like, when you look at him or whatever, they're kind of competitive with you, but maybe they do something just this much different than you, Mm -hmm. you know, like a just different in philosophy or something like that. So it's like, oh, I'm against that guy. And then they open their mouth and say one word to you and it's real nice. You're like, oh, I love that guy. You know, just one little thing, just one little like, hey, I'm cool. You know, I like you kind of thing. And it's like, oh man. Yeah, when they say something humble to you, it it disarms your ego and you're all of a sudden your bros. Yeah, so weird how that is. But if they don't, if they escalate the ego situation, then it's very problematic. It happens all the time too, man. happens all the time. I mean, really, that's the natural course of things because you do have to put on the brakes on your feelings and be like, okay, let's make a different kind of decision than the automatic one. I got to switch to manual real quick and then boom. But but the bottom line is you're going to interact with all kinds of different people. If you're in any kind of team whatsoever, which is most, most human beings interact with other human beings through their job, through their life, through, I mean, you could apply this to your family too, right? There's someone in your family that you don't get along with. Mm. Well, what good does it do? Does it make your family unit better when you, let those emotions play out and let your ego play out? No, it doesn't. You're better off, you'll get further and you'll have a better you'll have a better life in your family if you put your ego in check and mm-hmm. say, you know what, I'm just gonna build a relationship with this person. It's gonna make everything better and smoother. But it's like, man, if you it I feel like you can take the place of any marriage counselor by just saying that <laughs> for real. Like all you got to do is, and, and they got to do it, but all you got to do is ask like, is this going to help the relationship with my wife or my family or whoever yep. it is in your, is this going to help the relationship if I do this or don't do this or is it going to hurt it? And that's a, that's it. That's super general question or whatever, but it's, it's so cut and dry most of the time. Yeah, of course there's exceptions, but generally speaking, it's pretty cut and dry. 
and be like, okay. It and is. a lot of times, just like I said, it has to do with like your ego or mm-hmm. your, you know, this this sense of vengeance, little micro sense of vengeance because sure. I can't believe she doesn't respect the fact that I took out the trash, you know? She asks me to take the trash all the time. Finally, when I do it, nothing, you know, like, so it's just that. I was talking to a, a friend of mine and we were talking about, you, you know, I've talked about the mutiny that I had yeah, in, yeah, a, yeah. in a pl- SEAL platoon. But we had a mutiny. We fired. We had a mutiny against uh, our platoon commander. We fired. He, he got fired, and then the, the other guy that came in to take his place was like the best guy. Mm. And I was talking to a guy that worked with him much later when he was a senior, senior guy. And I was telling him, I was like, "Oh, when I talk on the podcast about the platoon commander that was like the best, that's who I'm talking." He's like, "No way!" And and th- this guy worked with me. He was a senior guy. And he says, you know, when he when I worked with him, he would take out his, he would take out the trash from the office every day, mm. and he, and I started laughing. I'm like, that's <laughs> it, that's right. And I'd be look, and he was saying like, oh, I'd look at him and be like, sir, you know, you don't need to do that. He's like, no, 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 it's all good. You know, somebody's got to take out the trash. I got it. Mm-hmm. This is a seat, a guy that shouldn't have been taking out trash for twenty five years, yeah. taking out the trash. Was he picking up brass? Picking up brass, taking out <laughs> trash. You know, that's that's being humble. Yeah, being humble goes a long way. Yeah. Next Check. question. We got time for one more. Cause I got stuffed. <laughs> sure. Dude. Hi, Jocko. I'm a veteran in graduate school. My mother passed away in April, and I took a few weeks off. While that was helpful, I'm struggling returning to work. My peers are younger and inexperienced. I'm the oldest in the in the cohort and probably the first vet to come to this grad program. I've already had some uphill battles, and up to this point, I truly believe I was worthy of my own suffering. Now, though, after sobbing on a plane while listening to episode 122, I don't feel as worthy. I wasn't there for my mother when she died. In fact, I cut her out due to her drinking, which is what killed her. I've lost people close to me in the past and in the service, but this is different. I know one thing. I'm a fighter. I've had to fight all my life to get where I am, but I'm feeling deflated. I mean, to start with, of course you feel deflated. Because you lost your mom. That's that's normal. But... What is not normal and what you have to fight against is staying deflated. So, I mean, listen, your mom is gone and you should certainly mourn that. You weren't by her side when she died. And this is due to the fact that you had to cut her off and you had to cut her off because of her drinking. If you don't cut someone off when they're going down that path, you're only enabling them. And that is not the right thing to do. And of course, we want to be able to save everyone. That's absolutely. We want to be able to save everyone, especially our own family members. But the fact of the matter is that you you just can't save everyone. No one can. No one can. Addiction is, in many cases, stronger than us. Stronger than anything. Stronger than love. Str- Believe it or not, stronger than life itself sometimes. That's how strong addiction is. And you cannot and are not expected to be able to defeat that. So you did what you could. And in the end, the battle was lost not because of you, but because of addiction. And it is hard to face that kind of loss.
but now how are you going to look at this how are you going to deal with this I look at it like this your mother your mother gave you a gift a precious gift she gave you the gift of knowledge if that knowledge allows you to see how destructive that force of addiction can be you saw it destroy her you saw that addiction destroy her because she showed it to you that was her last gift to you she she's actually given you life twice once at birth and once at her death she's actually shown you how to live by showing you how not to live so thank your mother for that literally thank her literally go to her graveside and get down on your knees and say thank you to her and then tell her that you won't let her down and then tell her that you will learn from her lesson and then tell her that you will go on to live an incredible life a life that she would be proud of a life that she didn't have but a life that she is making sure you can have now you said that you're a fighter and that's one thing you know is that you're a fighter well now get out there and fight and you know that that question and kind of thinking about the answer to that question that got me thinking about an article that I read about Anthony Bourdain and Anthony Bourdain obviously he was about as successful as as anyone could be I mean he was a successful guy in so many aspects and yet and yet he killed himself and I didn't know him personally but you know he knew people that I know you know he was he was friends with Joe Rogan he was he was friends with Harley Flanagan he was friends with guys that guys that are really good guys and so in that way I kind of felt like I knew what kind of a guy he was at least and even from the outside even without having any connections to him at all he, he was the kind of guy that had just about everything that 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 most people would want and even still I mean obviously that wasn't enough well in the article that I read there was a quote from one of Anthony Bourdain's books and the book was called a cook's tour he said in this book I wanted adventures I wanted to go up the Nung River to the heart of darkness in Cambodia I wanted to ride out into a desert on camelback sand and dunes in every direction eat whole roasted lamb with my fingers I wanted to kick snow off my boots in a mafia nightclub in Russia. I wanted to play with automatic weapons in Phnom Penh. Recapture the past in a small oyster village in France. Step into a seedy, neon-lit pulcheria 
in rural Mexico. I wanted to run roadblocks in the middle of the night, blowing past angry militia with a handful of hurled marble packs. Experience fear, excitement, wonder. I wanted kicks. The kind of melodramatic thrills and chills I'd yearned for since childhood. The kind of adventure I'd found as a little boy in the pages of my Tin Tin comic books. I wanted to see the world, and I wanted the world to be just like the movies. That's what Anthony Bourdain said, just like the movies. But you know what? To me, the world is not like the movies. The movies aren't real. They, they don't exist. But you do. And life, this life, is it's better than any movie there is. Movies are supposed to provoke emotion. They're supposed to make you feel something. But I have a better idea. Go out into the world and actually feel it. Go feel joy and love and triumph and rapture and ecstasy and glory. Go feel those things. And you know, with those feelings, there will be other feelings as well. There will be sorrow and pain and sadness and desolation and suffering. There'll be all those feelings too, but you know what? That's okay. That's okay. Take both sides. Feel all of it. That's what life is those feelings those emotions those highs and those lows those are life and those emotions and those feelings are better than any movie because they are real so make your own comic book make your life your own movie actually make it better than a movie not not better because it's more adventurous or more romantic or more melodramatic make it better because it's real It's real, so it is better. And you know what? Real comes with some downsides. Real comes with some darkness. But that's okay. It's okay because when you know the darkness the light becomes even brighter. So go out there, move toward the light, move toward the light, and live. Live. And I think that's all I've got for tonight. So, so Echo, let's talk to people a little bit about 
how to support this podcast and at the same time move themselves a little further away from the darkness and a little bit closer to the light because we make the podcast so everyone can learn and if you want to support the podcast mm-hmm. there are some really good ways to do it and that's the goal support the podcast and you're supporting yourself at the same time so yes what do you got they go hand in hand agree hundred thousand percent not possible but we'll deal with yeah, it yeah that's what i say can you agree one thing you know how they say i agree with you 110 percent I agree with you, but I think I feel 10% even more strong than what you just said. You know, okay. technically that could be it. We'll I'm just it. saying. Anyway, yes. So we'll start with Origin. Origin USA in Maine. Farmington, Maine, to be exact. American-made products. What do we got? Okay, geese. That's really the, the flagship. <laughs> I like the word flagship, by the way. Flagship product is the geese. Yeah. Made for jujitsu specifically, for jujitsu in America. Also made for specifically jujitsu, but usable for many different activities. What, like making a suit? Rash or? guards. Oh yeah, no, okay. I you was said gi is yeah. like flagship, right? Which I agree with. Oh, okay, but then yes. you also have rash guards. Other stuff. Yeah. Cool stuff. Compression gear. Compression gear. <laughs> yeah. Spats, if you will. Uh, yeah, for sure. But the geese aren't just like geese, though. See what I'm saying? They're not just a general gi. They're gi made in America, by the way, for jiu-jitsu specifically. Yeah. When you move in jiu-jitsu, it's different than moving in, I don't know, whatever else you might wear a gi in. Like tennis. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, bro. You were saying you were going to make a suit with the dragon yeah, weave. Yeah, that is you know, kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, so I actually had another. I, I have an idea of something to make with the dragon weave. I'm going to talk to Pete about all right, what yeah. is it? Lay it on me. Reveal. Reveal. Believe it or not, boots. Boots. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so they wouldn't be full dragon. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, they'd, gotcha. be, they'd be very similar to the old school Vietnam jungle boots, mm-hmm. but they'd have the dragon weave. Instead of canvas, they'd have dragon, dragon weave. weave. And because, which I think is the per, literally the perfect material okay. for the can- jungle, old school jungle boots are part leather, they're like leather around the toe and the heel. Yeah. But then they have canvas on the sides, and I, I wore jungle and I still wear jungle boots. I, I love jungle boots. So, yeah. yeah. So, I, but I, if we made, because the cotton canvas does stay wet mm-hmm. longer, but if we use the dragon weave, it dries quicker because it's a blend. Mm-hmm. But cotton is also very comfortable to wear, mm-hmm. it allows circulation. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, that's what I'll, I'll talk to Pete. We'll make it happen. So, the, the shorts that I have yeah. that no one else can have is Dragon Weave, right? Yeah. That is yeah. okay. So I was talking to Pete about oh, let's make some more, and we went through the thing. That's whole other thing. But here's here's what I do remember. If you since you brought up boots, where okay, so those shorts, you know, I have kids, mm-hmm. and with kids comes messes, mm-hmm. you know, where they'll spill some, I don't know, whatever. So stuff will land on those shorts, and you know the kind where it's like, dang, I don't want to take off these shorts and go wash them. Like, let me just put some water, mm-hmm. and but then some of the messes is like, you can't just put water and it goes away. You got to scrub it. Mm-hmm. But if they're like normal shorts, I'm gonna scrub it with like a brush, and it's gonna kind of mess up the shorts a little bit right there. You know, it'll make it like kind of fr- it'll fray them or uh-huh. something like that. Bro, not these ones, bro. I'm scrubbing it with a steel wool thing to get Damn. the thing out. Bro, the thing is like new still. Aside from like the cotton part fades, right? The sh- you know how yeah. it's a blend, right? Yeah. So the cotton ones will fade. So it has this awesome little gray stripe with black. Bro, it's dope. It's incidental uh, dopeness improvement. Yeah. In the in the aesthetic look. There you go. That's a side note. But I'm saying it's tough with the you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it kinda makes sense now. Dragon weave boots, boom, you're in the jungle, fishing, <laughs> whatever else we're doing with them, and they, they handle. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I'll would, work on it. Would you make it like on the inside, would it be uh what do you call it? Water resist proof no. or whatever? That's the thing with jungle boots, you don't want them waterproof. They're bru- they're highly breathable. You have little eyelets. Oh yeah. Huh? Little drains. So you want them highly breathable. Yeah, like yeah. like not even breathable open yeah there's holes it's purposely put in there Dang, so, so the, that's the concept is real jujitsu ish you know because like uh, on at first thought you'd be like hey you're gonna walk in water we need to fight that water no, no yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, hey allow the water in and, and allow the water out, out. Yep. yeah man that's good man. yeah it's good see bro that's why you're advanced <laughs> see you think about these kinds of things speaking of being advanced and comfortable 
advanced comfort with the joggers and the sweats. It's my mm. experience. Try it for yourself. Many people actually, I saw a guy today, maybe yesterday, today, yesterday, I forget, but he got the hoodie, one of Origins hoodie. Boom, seconded that exact notion. Most comfortable hoodie ever he's ever had. That's a bold statement. And I could just see tell from his profile picture that he knew about comfort. I don't know. It just I just could feel it. Nonetheless, it happened factually. Also, we got some supplements up there on the origin main dot com website. You can get some supplements. What kind of supplements, bro? What kind? Some good ones. Yeah. So joint warfare. That one, well, what, could we call that one a flagship supplement? <laughs> you can call everything. I'm gonna, flagship. I'm gonna call like it a how flagship. You're doing this today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the flagship is good, man. By the way, someone said, someone said on social media, go back to the old way you were doing the support. Oh, the new oh, yeah, way yeah. sounds clunky. Yeah. Said, give it back to Echo. He said, yeah, yeah. You know what I said? Couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna be honest. I will accept the possibility, probability of you not being the only one that thought that so <laughs> i'm gonna go with it uh, you know there was but, that one guy though he was fired up enough to tweet me yeah man and say brah sounds clunky dang i kind of appreciate it you yeah know? you're stoked i, can, I really should, do now that i think just, of it. we could have a separate podcast where you could just do supports <laughs> the whole time a separate version yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. you can kind of choose choose your own supports yeah maybe nonetheless Check. For now, this is what we're doing. We're going with joint joint warfare. Joint warfare. Right? Good for your joints. Omega-3 is good for your joints. And that's in krill oil. So you got joint warfare, glucosamine conjointin, and curcumin. Mm-hmm. That helps your brain, by the way. Yeah. As we found Additionally. out. Additionally. Additionally. Then you got uh, Thanks suja. Thanks to Rhonda Patrick. Yeah. Name? Rhonda Patrick, right? Yeah. It was like there. I read that too, by the way. It's good. Uh, then you got, okay, so you got joint warfare. Boom. Glucosamine chondroitin, that's for, for, I think, cartilage, if I'm not mistaken, joints, all this stuff. Boom, curcumin for some brain, some memory stuff. Boom, that's joint warfare. Then you got Jocko Super Krill. Mm-hmm. That's for your joints, omega-3s, and that's also for other parts of your anatomy. Stack nah, it up. It'll, we'll say your whole internal system. You didn't say your eyes? Eyeballs. Eyeballs. Eyeballs, organs, Just, brain. Can you crack open a krill oil capsule and put it directly into your eyes? Is you, that a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming no. Uh, you know, I'm going to have to. You know, but yeah, let's not do that, I think. I've been on krill oil for so long. Yeah. People, like, I don't want to ever go off of it. Yeah, I think that's a good idea to yeah. never go off of it. The reason is because I had a guy many years ago that was, uh, this is when I was probably 35. Sure. I met a guy that was 53, I think, and he was jacked. Yeah. And he was jacked, but he wasn't he wasn't jacked like a like a, a big bodybuilder juiced up guy, just right. jacked like totally athletic yeah. and in really great shape. And I was like, "Hey man, what what's the deal with, you know?" And he's like, "I take krill oil." Yeah. That's he's like that's the secret. He was, I was just like, attributing, I, yeah. He attributed all this. Now he was a competitive power lifter at one time, so he had maintained and continued to work out. Yeah, but he was basically saying that to me as if we already knew that. Like right, we right. already know that you got a jack steel. Like we, that's a given. Yeah. I'm just because I was talking to him for a while, and we were talking about lifting. We were talking about this, and and then finally, you know, I got to like, so what do you think it is? And he's like, I take curl oil. Mm. This was before, and I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when somebody tells you something, you just like you just look at the guy, and yeah. when they give that much weight to it, yeah, it's like okay, we're yeah, going, yeah, we're going cool. with that. Yeah. I'm not. And what's cool is that's that's I definitely I definitely felt the the difference in my joints. Yeah, I don't know about my eyeballs. Well, you know, although I don't wear things. glasses at this point. Yeah, there it is. Proof is that's, in the pudding. That's that's something. Yeah. It's not nothing, that's for sure. And the same way you, you um, well, not in the same way, but slightly similar way you had the powerlifter guy talk about krill oil. My father-in-law, as I've mentioned before, told me about krill oil, but way better than fish oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's telling me. or But was yeah, he jacked? He, here's the thing. He wasn't, isn't yeah, jacked. A, and here, this is part of the whole story, yeah. which kind of is going to kind of feed into your point. No, he is not jacked at all. <laughs> In fact, me and him go left, bro. This guy shouldn't even be in the same gym with me. He should be in the, the Are gym you across the street. going to hear this podcast? I don't care because oh, it's absolutely 100% dang. true. Not really doing a good job building that relationship <laughs> with the family. No. At the end of the day, you'll, you'll, you'll see the moral. And yeah, okay. I think it will. I think it will. Anyway, so no, not Jack. The answer is no. Um, he can swim for ever, mm-hmm. ever. 
In fact, he goes in Hawaii, me and Maui waters with the you know the web hands uh, you know for swimming. Okay, some bodyboarders use yeah. them sometimes. It's a, they're just web Spongers. hands. Spongers. Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, he doesn't. He's not a sponger, but he's a swimmer. So he'll just swim. Mm-hmm. Hour, boom, just swimming. Anyway, he'd always say you know krill oil, all this stuff. But yeah, he's not jacked. He doesn't lift. Like why? He, okay, you take krill oil and you get your X Y Z results. Cool. I don't want those X Y Z results. Those results that you're essentially benefiting from apparently Are don't apply to my the goals ones that you at want. all. Got exactly it. right. So I'm like, okay, cool. I get it. Health nut. He's a health nut. He's into health. That's a positive thing. No, it's not bad. Opinion. There's there's worse things to be a nut about. I'll tell you that. Health is a good thing. Anyway, but he's it into like health. You think it's a little bit better to be a health nut that's jacked. <laughs> 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 I'm not going to disagree. So, you know, for years. And I'm like, cool, good for the info. Yeah. Then you come along and you're like, yeah, krill oil. Boom. Next day. I'm on the <laughs> krill oil. Literally next day. And so, of course, he's been saying it the whole time yeah. or whatever. But at the end of the day, he's right. He's absolutely right. Yeah, he was right. Yeah. So, so, I got in the, so the moral of the story is you can be right and not jacked. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Jack. Gotta, I got to kind of separate, you know, my, what do you call it? I got to detach is mm, what I got to do. Yeah, you know, true. like an older guy with the ability to do the things and at the health level he's at, I do want for myself, regardless how much weights I can lift or can't lift. Mm-hmm. That's what I want. That's what you want. Yeah, Yeah, man. Big time. And here's the thing. I didn't think indirectly as well, because the better your joints feel, especially as you get older, but just in life, regardless how old you are, the better your joints are functioning, the more you're going to be able to lift or uh, mountain climb or ride bike or compete in badminton. Badminton. How do you say that? Badminton. Okay. Yeah. Compete in that. It's true, bro. You don't be all stiff. With you don't the, need tennis or badminton yeah. elbow, you know, yeah, for anyway, krill oil. That's the one. Omega threes. And then you have discipline, mm-hmm. right? And that's for your brain, memory, cognitive things. So they play into each other. You see what I'm saying? So the joint warfare has the brain stuff and the joint stuff. Krill oil has the joint stuff. I had stuff. a really good day at jujitsu the other day. And I was talking to Dave Burke on my way home from jujitsu. Good deal, Dave. Yeah. Good deal, Dave. And, and I was like, I was. You know, you said, oh, yeah, I trained today. I was like, I had a really good day <laughs> <laughs> at that jujitsu. He's like, what does that mean? I'm like, oh, it just means, you know, like yep. just getting after it. Just... Yeah. And I realized that the past, anyways, I realized that I've been taking like three scoops of discipline oh, prior to training. Is. Okay, all right. <laughs> is that yep. illegal? Yeah, well, you know, is arguably that not it, fair? it could be, it should be, maybe, yeah. Well, it depends on what you mean by fair. Because if you're going in to compete with your training partners, which you do from time to time, <laughs> let's face it, then yeah, it's a little bit of an advantage. We'll say. Yeah. Yeah. Fair? Yeah. No, it's actually yeah. it's fair. Andy or whoever you go into train with, yeah. Dean, me, we could take three things of discipline. If you wanted to. If you wanted to. It's fair. It's fair. In fact, I recommend take three things of discipline. Boom. There it is. Discipline. Cognitive enhancing. So they all play yeah. with each other. That's important. Very important, <laughs> I think, regardless of how much you can lift. Yeah, check. Also, mulk. M- mulk. What is mulk? <laughs> what is that? Who, someone was just asking me about mulk. And the best thing about when people ask you what mulk is, mm-hmm. is you get it, you get a chance to do the routine. <laughs> sure. Right? You get a chance to do the routine. When someone's like, oh, what's mulk? Mm-hmm. Oh, what's that? What's mulk? Yeah. And you're allowed, you, you get to do the routine, which is, what's mulk? Oh, it's mulk. That's the routine. That's the routine. <laughs> you're like, well, what is it? It's milk. No, yeah. it's milk. Yeah. You want some kind of a explanation? You're like, no, no, it's it's milk. Yeah, yeah. Common sense, yeah. really. Yeah. After you say that, it's it, you just take common sense from there, and, and boom, clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Good. my goal. My goal is that it ends up in the Oxford English Dictionary. Yeah, like Xerox. And then if someone doesn't know what it is. They can just go look it up. Yeah, look it up. Yeah. In the dictionary, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Like, That's my goal. Like Google. Is Google in there for like a yes. verb? Yes. It's a Google verb. Google is in there as Google a verb. Yeah, right. Go Google that. Well, yeah. So, be so f- go Google milk. Mulk. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. You'll find it. Yes, sir. You will. You'll know what it is. Well. You'll know that it's tasty. The guy that said, hey, I, I, I don't use protein powders, but- does it taste that good that I should just get it anyways? Yes. <laughs> My answer was 100% yes. resounding. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, just yeah. want to have a, a really good dessert? Get yeah. milk. Yeah. Peanut butter's coming. So Dave Burke is Dave Burke is on the path to uh, 
to order all the <laughs> all the peanut butter chocolate. Anyways, oh, the whole supply. Yeah, yeah he wants the whole supply. Not a bad idea. Yeah. Shoot, I thought about so that. Check. But yeah, so yeah, if you don't know, milk. Look, I'm gonna violate some terminology scenarios here. Milk is protein powder. It's actually milk. Yeah, man. <laughs> the best protein powder that tastes like a dessert straight up does though not just claims and doesn't it does straight up literally a and we will have milk at the immersion camp this summer up in maine on echo lake layers august 26th through september 2nd two sessions come up there i'll be there leif will be there echo charles will be there and apparently you say you will be rolling yeah limited okay Okay, limited rolling from from which sounds like predetermined excuses which is fine yeah, well, here, okay, all right, well, let, let me lay it out then, Playboy. Uh, the uh, the gi I'll be doing less of because gi has a lot uh, of the gripping, yeah. gripping, pulling. So yeah. pulling, I'm really, bro, I'm out of pulling. I can't do pulling. Yeah. Very limited, maybe with one hand. So I'll do gi, but it's like, okay, now I'm rolling literally with one hand. By the no way, Dean Lister different. will be there. Yeah. Dean Lister will be there, and if you want to learn from someone, he is one of the top people in the world to learn from. And I know that's a bold statement. Yeah. I know it is. He's got a mind that understands not only the mechanics and the concepts of jujitsu at a at it one of the highest levels of anyone I've ever communicated with, but also knows how to express those concepts in a yeah. very clear way. So immersion camp, August twenty sixth through September second. Go and come up there. We'll see you up there. Good place to. And yeah. we will have milk there. Yes, sir. Lots of it. And Dean's good at, at kind of taking the concept and really clarifying the concept, even separate from the actual yeah, for move. Sure. I mean, the move's always attached, but... Dean says things sometimes that I run over and take no- take like a little a little note on my uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. on my phone. I can remember that one. Yeah, I'm like, oh, that's a good one. And yeah. usually, I say, usually I'm thinking I'm going to, when we when he comes on the podcast, I'll, I'm going to ta- have him talk about those things. Yeah. So Open them up. Yeah. Also, good way to support is the fact... Or on top of the fact, or is part of the fact that Jocko has his own store. It's called Jocko Store. Let's go to JockoStore.com for these items. It's where you can get rash cards. You can definitely get rash cards. Yes. Get after it. <laughs> t-shirts. A bunch of t-shirts. Yeah. The ones that say discipline equals freedom. New t-shirt coming? New t-shirts are coming. Oh, t-shirts with yes. plural. Yeah. Oh, dang. It's two of them. If, yeah. If you're interested in the t-shirts, the ones that say discipline equals freedom, it's a good one. I get revealed how deep the expression discipline equals freedom goes. Like almost day, not, not daily, you but let's you, say once a week. You mean you understand it at a deep level? Deeper level, It's yes. presented, it's revealed to you how important it is. Yes, yeah. how much, even more than I pre- for previously thought the week before. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, like, it's almost like it has no no limit to the layers. It's of, pretty important. Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. It's and you, I, actually, I've been sporting the Discipline Equals Freedom hat, the yeah. trucker hat. So, and I also have the deaf beanie. Get yes. some. Yeah, that's a good one. So you got that, those are available. Mm-hmm. Check. Yep. Um, yes, and also hoodies, heavy hoodies and light hoodies. I know, bro. I know, I know, I know, I know. But I have been getting uh, feedback online and offline, by the way, for the light hoodie. Oh, the people whole, just love them, huh? Bro, they want the light hoodie, man. Oh, they want to represent, yeah. you know, like I said. What's hey, up, Hawaii? Bro. I'm telling you, there there are times, <laughs> all your many friends times, in Hawaii, yeah, all, all them, everybody, and all the Ohana in Hawaii is hitting you up, <laughs> the Kama Aina, yeah. all them, yes, yeah. and because in Hawaii and other places here, let's face it, <laughs> there are times where it's like, hey, like yesterday was one of them. It's like, bro, it's kind of it's kind of cold, but it's not cold. It's kind of cold. If you wear a t-shirt, it's like, man, this environment. <laughs> Weather is offering, no, is suck it offering, up. no, see, no, just f- no, no def n- negative, <laughs> negative, nope, that's not, to me, especially if you're at like a little gathering, <laughs> social Comfort situation, it's maybe, uh, <laughs> it could be looked at as paramount, but here's what it is, if, if the, inv- if the weather 
whatever environment is offering <laughs> slight discomfort you, know you have laughing? a right you know why i'm no. laughing so hard right now because everything you're saying is things that i wouldn't allow myself or yeah, anyone in my immediate family to, to say to admit yeah, yeah i get it you know i got Suck you it, up. it doesn't make it any, <laughs> it doesn't make it any more true <coughs> that's the thing so hey look i mean you were cruising right outside maybe not you i if, get it if dude. me and Dave, look, i don't I think you do it. i don't think you do that's the thing <laughs> if me and dave brooke were cruising okay. how about that maybe he'd want a little and yeah it's sweatshirt. like it's just maybe three degrees too cold <laughs> suck it up. yeah you can suck it up but what why you got to endure discomfort at times when it's not necessary unless you're exercising your tolerance for discomfort which you should be doing. which you should at all point at all times yes. that's what you're saying affirmative no okay, okay me and dave brooke we don't agree with this so you put on a regular hoodie or heavy or even a medium hoodie after what, five minutes, six minutes, we worked out earlier today, whatever, that heat, it's too hot. So thick hoodie, too hot, no hoodie, too cold. <laughs> Boom, light hoodie, perfect. Cause you don't know Check. about that perfection, uh, you know, dichotomy, man, you know, the zone, balance the zones. Okay. Anyway, light hoodie, this one equals freedom. That's the freedom part, boom, how about that? Women's stuff as well, by the way women's t-shirts specifically for the ladies and tank tops boom rash guards are kind of for everybody so boom you can also subscribe to this podcast sure itunes google play stitcher leave reviews so i can read them and laugh because you guys are really good at writing uh cool reviews that crack me up so thank you for that mm-hmm stitcher as well by yeah. the way don't Wait, forget about the youtube you can subscribe to youtube too yeah. and that's where you'll see echo charles's videos sure we'll say that's we'll say you've got some skills in life that's thanks one of your paramount skills making cool videos cool agree or disagree yeah uh sure that's not good i'm putting you on the spot to not be humble so i won't do that echo makes good videos and they're on youtube you need to subscribe to the channel jocko podcast youtube channel okay well there you go very easy to find very basic very subscribable mm-hmm. anyway yeah good way to support for sure also some excerpts on there you know little lessons from this podcast directly mm-hmm. and uh, you know so sometimes you don't want to listen to let's say you listen to podcast number 101 and you're like hey there's some good stuff in there but should i listen to the whole you know however many hours of the podcast for that one lesson that i want to kind of revisit should you do that mm, some of us don't have that kind of time so I'm going to put out some excerpts from all the podcasts, most of them. So, yeah, go on there, subscribe, get a little alert when we put one up. If that's the one you want to listen to, boom, listen to it. Good way to support, too, by the way. Also, on it, on it.com slash Chaco. This is where I get all my kettlebells. I won't say all my socks, but a lot of socks. That's where I get them from. I know, sounds weird, but, man, it's one of those things. Sometimes you appreciate the socks you're wearing, especially when you're going through the airport. TSA, boom, you got to take off your shoes, boom, hit them with the Onnit socks. Anyway, fitness gear mainly, I think. That's that's what I go. And for the information, too, by the way. Like kettlebells, when I started kettlebells, I heard good things, you know. I start the kettlebells. They're kind of, they're intimidating. So, boom, go on Onnit.com. They have all the info on there, little things about form, little workouts. Really good. Good on maces, too. Are they called battle maces? Just maces, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't. They're steel sticks. Clubs. Clubs that look like, you know, the juggling clubs. Yeah, but they but have they're, 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 you, you know. can't juggle them. That's yeah. the thing. If you could juggle those, you'd be a you'd be a complete badass. If yeah. you could juggle those twenty pounders. Yeah. They're freaking heavy. Yeah. And they're heavier than they sound when you say twenty pounds. Yeah, it's no, no, no. I'm telling 20 you. Pounds. I'm yeah. telling you. They're heavy. The only the way they're twenty pounds. The only way they even they can even justify saying twenty pounds is when you actually put them on the scale and the number yeah, yeah. happens to say twenty. You, you would, otherwise, it's not twenty. You'd pounds. You think they were not made out of metal, but some, yeah. you know, something from outer space. If you brought them to the airport and you know when you're checking in, yeah. you know, and you put the your luggage on the scale and you know you were pushing it, you know that it may be over fifty pounds and you're like nervous, right? And then it doesn't hit 50 pounds. If you got that mace, you have that mace in your hand, you're about to put that on the scale, you know, you know, oh, this is going over. I'm paying that extra overage uh, uh, fee. That's what it feels like. I'm sorry, as far as the the mace goes. Anyway, happens to be a good thing to work out with. But you grab that thing, you're going to be like, okay, what kind of workout am I going to do with this? Boom, 
on it dot com slash Jocko. Look up the the workout. You got it. Also, Psychological Warfare. It's an album that has various tracks on it that you can play to push you through moments of weakness. And we are we are formulating Psychological Warfare too. All your excuses are lies. Yes. A, work, a working title. Working title. Yeah, working yeah. title. But it's a pretty good title. Also, Jocko White Tea. Mm. Here's the thing. I'm a tea drinker now. I don't know if you know that. I'm a tea drinker now. I drink tea regularly. I think that's kind of all it takes, really. But there was a whole thing when I, I didn't realize. I didn't know that tea drinker had like some stereotypical thing behind it. Yeah, yeah. So when I came out with, with white tea, people were like, oh, it's really weird that you'd make tea because they yeah. think I'd I'd be making whatever. Milk. Milk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. They think I'd make milk, but they wouldn't think I'd you make You don't tea. strike me as a tea drinker. Yeah. I didn't realize that. So yeah. I guess we're changing the paradigm yeah. and those stereotypes will not be expected mm-hmm. accepted anymore. Yeah. Agree. I drink tea and I'm proud. Maybe you're changing. You're just evolving the stereotype. Maybe. Because you are a tea drinker. Oh, straight You've up. You've been drinking tea since day one. Not really since day one, but since I figured out. Day two? Yeah. Day two. Yeah. There you go. Boom. Yeah. So Jocko White Tea, pomegranate, all organic certified, by the mm-hmm. way, because, you know, Jocko cares about that kind of stuff in the bags and in the can. Big deal. In the can. Most tea drinkers care about certified organic, I think. Yeah. Like it was. Well, That's like, another stereotype. <laughs> so GMO tea, no good. Yeah, no good. Ah, we don't have like that. We'll not put that in my body. The temple. Yeah, you're right. Agree. You get it on Amazon. And in fact, I think that's the only place you can get it. Actually, t- well, it is the only place you can get it right now. And important fact: there's dry white tea that you put in a brew, mm-hmm. and then there's the new thing, which is in a can. Yeah, that's. And how one I thing it. that's fired up right now is people that are replacing the twelve, or not the twelve, but they're replacing the four energy drinks. Yeah. Which actually give you no energy. They actually sap your energy and crush your soul and turn you into a a, a health disaster. Sure. People are replacing that crap with Jocko White tea. Yeah. In a can. Yeah. One day it's gonna be everywhere. That's my suspicion. Yeah, You're yeah. You're just yeah. gonna be and people will just be Well, you know the one your Jocko <laughs> White tea on. <laughs> yeah. You know, speaking of uh, oh yeah, and also available in Canada. I know a lot of Canadian folks say, Where is this stuff? Why can't I get up here? So it's now available Amazon Canada. Yeah. I'm gonna put it on the store too. Okay. And I've been working on it, you know, and we're almost there. So check back with the store. Jocko store. Okay, um, that's a good place to have boom, it. Boom, they can get the tea wherever. I don't care if you're in wherever Jocko products are sold. <laughs> bro, that's where they're sold. Uh, speaking of Amazon books, I got some books. Good, yeah. One, two are called mm-hmm. Way of the Worry Kid. Mm-hmm. Way of the Worry Kid from Wimpy to Warrior, right? That's the what do you call it after the colon that part? It's the subtitle, I sure. think. Sure, there it is. Wimpy to Warrior, and then the second one is Mark's Mission. Mm-hmm. Really clever evolution of mm. problems to be solved mm-hmm. in both. Mm-hmm. So now you have the ethos. Okay, so how I, w- I did it, do it, is I read the first one and I just keep repeating to my kids. Kids five. My daughter old is five. Anyway, before bedtime, boom, and then repeating. Now we got two in the rotation. Boom. So you can, they're chrono- chronological, right? Boom. It is good. Very clever. Very on what do you call it when you assume something about somebody and it reveals that there's like more to this person oh so you assumed i was yes I not assume, capable yes, of writing way of the word uh, yes, well very, i actually very, did write very, it <laughs> very incapable Check. Yeah. Check. um but yeah it's a good one also the discipline equals freedom field manual it's a field manual best kind of manual in my opinion but this is like a manual for life i think it's like a very basic backbone for life i it think is. you start there you'll be you'll be solid i'm always stoked when i meet someone that comes up and it's like, Rufio Manual. Yep. I'm on the path. Yeah. And like, they're not kidding. They're yeah. on the path. Yeah. You crack that thing open, read two pages. Yeah. Read two pages to prep mentally for the day. Yeah. It will have impact. Yeah, yeah. And if you want to listen to those pages, it's not available on Audible. Mm-hmm. It's available on iTunes, Amazon Music, Google Play as an MP3 album with tracks. That's where you can get it. Of course, you can also get Extreme Ownership. Extreme ownership, you can get the the, the hardcover book. Mm-hmm. And you can also get the audible. That one, you can get the audible version. And the audible version is Leif and I reading that book. 
that's that's who's reading it that's who's doing the narration and then also Leif and I have a book called the dichotomy of leadership which I've talked about dichotomy all the time on this podcast the reason I talk about it is because it's hard to I don't even say master it's hard to even get a grip on that dichotomy the different dichotomies inside of leadership Mm -hmm. and so Leif and I knew that we had to go into a more granular level of explanation of the dichotomy of leadership and that's what this new book is it comes out September 25th and also for leadership training live inside your organization whatever that organization might be check out my company echelon front leadership consulting we solve problems through leadership that's that we have one more muster in 2018 the muster is a leadership conference we have one more in 2018 It is in San Francisco October 17th and 18th October 17th and 18th all the other ones that we've done have sold out if you want to come get your ticket you can get it at extremeownership.com and also for current uniformed personnel so people in the military law enforcement board patrol firefighters paramedics first responders we have roll call number one September 21st in Dallas Texas that's also you can also register for that extremeownership.com that's one day focused on the dynamic leadership environment so it's like a muster more focused on the issues of first responders right. essentially yeah mm-hmm. but well, it is essentially military. a muster it's a muster it's, like shorter it's a, a shorter shorter muster it's more focused it's a cheaper price point and it's one day there's less uh, amenities right so when you come to the muster everything's kind of kind of decked out like the the lunch meals really good the, the, the dinner's great I mean, it's, it's like decked out gotcha. it's taken amenities. to the, the highest level the the Roll call is like, hey, we're here to get the information out to people that need it. Yeah, people that are in the field every day, whether it's in the military, whether it's on the beat as a cop, whether it's a firefighter. You know, for people that are on the job, people in uniform that we try and support, we, they need this leadership training. They asked for this leadership training. We needed to do it at a cheaper price point. Where can we save money and still get it done? There you go. That's what the that's what the roll call is. And, but it's the same deal as far as there's no backstage. You oh know, no, situation. definitely no You're backstage. still in the t- yeah. game. Talking to everybody yeah. the whole day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll be there. No green room. No green room. And until we do see you big time at either the muster or the roll call or the immersion camp in Maine, if you want to roll with us virtually, virtually. we are all up on the interwebs on Twitter and Instagram and that facey block. <laughs> Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And to those of you in uniform that wear the cloth of the nation, without you, this podcast and our freedom would not exist. So thank you to police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, border patrol, other first responders. Thank you for keeping us safe while we sleep. And also... To those in uniform, thanks to your families for their sacrifice. That is a hard job as well. And to everyone else, thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting. Thanks for moving away from the darkness and toward the light. Thanks for fighting. Thanks for getting after it. And most of all, thanks for living. So until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.